excited to have Wendy McDougall join us from Firefish Software today um, for a couple of reasons. She's an absolute expert in recruitment software, but also she comes from a recruiting background and has has built several formidable businesses. So she certainly knows about um, how to grow a business and and the challenges, I guess, that that, um, that small business operators face, particularly recruiters. So welcome. And perhaps, Wendy, if you'd like to just give us a little bit of a rundown on um, on yourself and how Firefish came about. Yeah, sure. And listen, thanks very much, guys, for having me all the way from Scotland. So delighted to be involved. Um, yeah, as you said, Wendy McDougall, CEO of Firefish Software. Um, and it, it really came about from uh, the frustration uh, within our industry as a recruiter. Um, so I've been uh, recruiting actually in the tech sector for the last sort of 20 years um, and I ran my own agency so I, I was a top biller at uh, Melville Craig and, and one that uh, was taken over by Hudson so you possibly know that name yeah. um, and, and I, I remember uh, I was sort of helping a lot out with that sort of mer merger or, or acquisition and when I had to take the value of entrepreneurialism off the wall I thought it was time for me to leave <laughs> um, so at that point <laughs> So at that point, I, I, I went out, um, I did about a year just uh, growing a tech business um, just to pay out my, um, uh, my restrictions and then set up a, a recruitment agency. So I, I did what most of your listeners will probably do at that point. The first thing you've got to do is get yourself organized and get some good software in the business. Um, and I did the, I call it the beauty parade. So I went and did the beauty parade of all the, the great software that's out there. Um, and um, I, I was a bit bit frustrated um, in terms of, uh, you know, the actual offerings. And, and I suppose that's, we can go into a little bit in, in for detail, but I suppose the reason why I was frustrated was probably because as a recruiter, and this is what I love about recruitment, is you're so privileged to get to understand an industry that you actually recruit for. And I was so passionate about the tech sector and I could see where all the techs, tech was moving and what was happening in that market and, you know, the e-commerce side of it and how consumers were changing their buying behavior that I could definitely see that this was going to affect the job seeking market. But when I looked at all the vendors out there, nobody was thinking of it in that way. And um, so that's really where I took things, you know, matters into my own hands and uh, we started. We migrated from one of the largest um, recruitment software players at that point, and we migrated um, our, my business onto to what is now Firefish back in 2005. So uh, yeah, so so that so actually our software, although many people might not have um, be fully aware of the, the the Firefish brand, you know our software has been up and running, you know, for quite a substantial number of years. Um, but it's really in the last three years that uh, you know we've really been growing growing and and um, gaining great traction so um so yeah it's been an exciting journey yeah it's a really good story and so Wendy so we you and I were just talking off screen before we started recording and um I'm clearly living in the dark ages because I started talking about CRM and you very politely told me that things have moved on a little bit from there and it's now more sort of, you know, I guess sales and marketing. So would you mind just elaborating on that a little bit for the for people who are watching, perhaps exploring their options at the moment? Yeah, certainly. And don't worry, you're not in the back, the 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 um the, the back end or anything like that. Um, the dark ages. Um, you know, you're you're not alone as well. Um, I I probably say to lots of recruitment owners that I talk to, um. That, um, you know, in many ways, I, and I'm an advocate of technology, but in many ways, technology, I think, is, has actually come and overly complicated our lives in recruitment. Um, and, and probably it's easier if I show you I show you a wee slide because it, I think I'm a visual Perfect. person. I think a lot of recruiters are. So maybe if I just show you this, but this is really sort of problem that I saw happening with my own business and with many business owners just now. So down at the bottom here, you've got the database. And as recruiters, we're great at piling information into this database um, because we all know if a candidate is not right for us today, they might be right for us tomorrow. But then we're actually not very good at doing anything with that candidate. Um, so and this is where I suppose when you ask me that question, you know, CRM system, applicant tracking system, this is where I felt that the market got stuck mm. because everybody was just piling this into a database to sort of administer and move stuff across and track notes. And don't get me wrong, that's a good function. But that was for me just standard as a recruitment owner that you needed. Um, it didn't really add any innovation and it wasn't progressing the business. So then what I quickly saw is because we pile all that information into a database, then um, when your recruiters get a similar job, maybe eight months, 12 months later, they look at the database and they go, ah, oh, 
do you know what? That's too hard. Um, I'm going to have to go and update all those candidates anyway. They're all out of date. So all I found was my cost to acquire, i.e. job boards and now paid campaigns, was going up and up and up and up. Um, But if you've been in the business for a good couple of years, data is easy to get now. It's what you do with that data. So I was also finding when I analysed it, eight out of 10 candidates that were coming through those channels of either job boards or all your social channels, you had them on the database in the first place. Mm -hmm. So effectively, you're paying an extortionate rate just to update your database, Mm -hmm. which I thought was nuts. So that was me sort of going, "Mm, don't like that. (laughs) Very typical, because essentially what you've also found is the job board market, good candidates don't need to sit on some of the job boards. They just need to change their LinkedIn status. So or one of their different status and say, hey, I'm looking. So the actual response rate was going down. So what that happened was as recruiters, and I get it, we wanted that instant gratification that there are candidates for our jobs, you know, our clients screaming at us. And we need to get candidate quickly. So we need to know, do we have anybody to work with? So I can say to my client, I'm interviewing, I'm I'm progressing. So that's where this sort of um, instant gratification came from. But actually, the results of it were, were, were not great. And as one job board sort of failed to deliver, you then piled another one. But you didn't want to give up on that job board just in case. And, and that's what I just saw the cycle going on and on. Um, and then at the top end, we've got our website. Now, fortunately, I can say um, that in the last sort of three years, certainly over in the UK, um, recruiters are definitely spending a bit more money and recognising that their website is now their shop window. If we go back, you know, 10 years ago, it used to be you had to have, you know, your shop front window on the main street to get the walk-ins and the candidates walking past seeing your jobs. Well, that no longer is a necessity. You can be, as you're doing right now, sitting at home and running a good business. Um, so now our shop front window needs to be online and we need to be able to get found. So people are now starting to 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 spend a bit of money in the web but they're actually not then making that website their biggest asset and making it work for them so generally they might do a wordpress or a plugin for their jobs um and you've got an email address so you fill out a candidate form and it goes into a big email pot so then what happens is somebody's got to a keep your jobs up to date on the website so that becomes an admin task and then you're reliant on somebody that's looking at your info box and making sure that they're identifying is it a good candidate is it not should we move on then quickly should somebody and if they if they're off a day or they miss somebody for half a day then you know it's so fierce out there with com- com- um, competition that if you don't act on that candidate straight away, you've lost them to your competitor. They've screened them in for the job, um, and then it becomes an admin task to put them onto the database to die. And this circle I just found goes round and round. And this is fundamentally what all recruitment agencies and it's fine when you're doing it yourself right if you're a one-man band you know what's going on but as soon as you start to scale Mm -hmm. so as soon as you start to get to that stage where you know you've got your first group you're putting in a team management I always say that's about five sort of recruiters in there you need somebody to then take the team responsibility you you then need to have eyes on all the activities within your business and this structure which I'm sure a lot of your audience will will relate to doesn't give it to you Mm. so so that was really where I come in um and and this is what we've done about it so this is where going back to your question you know um where where do you sit with your CRM or your applicant tracking system as I said we do everything you would expect down at the bottom of the funnel. Um, but what we're then doing is bringing all of those new channels that a recruiter now needs to look at from a marketing point of view. And we're bringing that into this new workflow. So just like we're very much used to, um, you know, job on, matching against the jobs, let's organize our interviews, let's get CV sent, then getting hiring interviews and then offer to placement. We all know that workflow backwards. What I'm doing is working that pipeline from um, from the starting point in terms of, OK, you know, create a job and start that process going in terms of matching who's on your database. But then click a button and then you're starting to reach new candidates. You're optimizing it straight onto your web. It's all ready for job schemas. It's all optimized that so you'll get found by new candidates. But that gives you what's called like a landing page, mm-hmm. which is an optimized on your own website, fully no sort of branding with Firefish or anything else. It's your asset. And that gives the recruiters the ability to then post out that vacancy 
very quickly to just under 200 networks in terms of social and every link back is good authority to your web so we're constantly thinking about building value on your website and then in the middle and this is the sort of I suppose this is the clever bit that I just thought nobody's doing just now um, is if you think about Amazon every time you go onto Amazon you buy something so if I was to buy this mouse then they're going to profile and work out that I like this mouse um, I might want a keyboard with this mouse and might come back for a different type of mouse that might be pink the next time I'm looking. So they're understanding and they're delivering personal content to me on how I interact with Amazon. So why as agencies can we not start to understand how a candidate starts to interact with your vacancies? So we can then see and re-engage with your candidates in terms of when you send out job alerts, email marketing, which is targeting your candidates. And this goes out to your database. And then if you have not been in contact with a candidate for say two years, if they start to click on those on that content and they start to get to your apply page but they don't apply instead of that candidate being down at the bottom of your list because you haven't talked to them in two years we're putting it right up to the top of the recruiters list and saying call them mm. and and that's really the key so that's where I say that actually Farfish we're trying to say you know we're we're, we're more of a sales and marketing pro you know uh, sales and marketing software for our recruitment agencies and that's probably where you know, you, you um we, we're changing the dynamics of how you set up your recruitment agency in effect great okay no I think that's really exciting and I think it's just perhaps it's you know like many things in not just recruitment but other industries it's just what we're doing today is so often a, a legacy of the past and we just need to re yeah. rethink it and re-engineer it which you, you guys are obviously doing a brilliant job at so Wendy when you're out in the market talking with um with agency owners that what are the and they're thinking about you know getting new software what are the what are some of the bigger problems that they're facing or the, the bigger questions that they're asking you yeah I, th I think firstly and who can blame them you know we're not this is probably the one piece of um you know kit or investment that a recruitment owner makes and it's the biggest one probably that you make mm -hmm. and we're not kind of used to that process of how do we buy mm -hmm. um so you tend to get people that um, will look at lot, and there's lots of there's lots of software out there as well, and probably get a little bit confused and a wee bit burnt out. You know, as I say, the beauty parade, because every software will do something to actually help and you know give you a unique selling point in terms of how it's going to enhance your business. So I think that comes back to the fact that don't start this process before you kind of understand where you want your business to go. Mm. Um, and that's probably one of the things that you go, right, I want to buy software, let's see the software. Oh my goodness, there's probably about a hundred to ch ch choose from. How do I narrow it down? Mm. So I, I think the first step is take a step back, think about where your business is, um, where could you be actually um, you know, improving the efficiency of your business. But not only that, where could you actually, where do you want your business to go? Mm. You know, because I think recruitment agencies are having to change right now. And you've got to, you know, a, a corporate has just as many tools as the agency market does. And they, they basically feel that they can recruit directly themselves. So, mm. Oh, how is your agency going to be able to actually go into that corporate and give them a very compelling reason why they actually need to go with you? Mm -hmm. OK, and so if you think about that, then can you use technology to give you or give that that agency a compelling reason why the corporate should give them their business? Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the things is look at where you are right now and what you need in order to try and where's your problems in your business and what do you need to actually get over but also look at where do you want to go um, and the next big thing is never underestimate actually understanding um, the company that you're buying into um, what you'll find now with software as a service so everybody's quite comfortable now with cloud technology and the fact that you it's easier to migrate it's easier to come on board it's easier to leave which I think is a very healthy thing for our industry because it means that vendors like ourselves have to work really hard to make sure that you're happy and want to stay with us but that means you're actually coming on board and you're following a journey with that company. So it's important to understand where that company is going because you're going to be like for ourselves. We we do weekly releases out to our customers. So they're getting weekly improvements. So if you're wanting weekly improvements in a certain direction, 
Um, and that's not the direction or the vision of the company you're buying into, you're always going to be frustrated. Mm. Okay, so really understand about positioning and a software that tells you they can do everything. I just don't think is right right for for an agency so I really think the agency get behind the scenes talk to the person that's either demoing or helping you evaluate and somebody that says yes they can do temps they can do contracts they can do permanent they can do marketing they can do um, nurturing they can do web they, they can do sales pipelining etc it's not out there and it's not possible in the the route that they're always going to be continuing to you know to improve on and you want to buy into the company that's going the same direction as you because then you're just going to constantly get new features that you're going to be excited about so i think that's also something in the culture of the support they should take on board yeah that's and it's it's hard because the i was saying to you i've done this four times and it's never it, it's it's never the experience that you think it's going to be when you when you set out from yeah. the beginning and and to be fair to the the um the companies we've used part of that was our problem because we just didn't really know what to ask it's like we okay we need something yep okay let's let's go ahead so are there any questions or yeah questions that you would recommend that um the the company owners ask like the sort of some bigger broad brushstroke questions that they can ask to start to channel channel down in the right areas and quickly decide whether a company might be right for them or not yeah sure so i think um what's your average customer look like in terms of sector recruitment functional sort of expertise and size of company um i think that's a really good profile and do you sit within that profile or are you a bit of an anomaly <laughs> okay um so I think that's one of the biggest ones there. Um, I think also, you know, what's coming up in your roadmap for the next two to three months, probably asking a vendor as well. A lot of people will think that they can sort of say the next year. That's actually now that's actually now too far away. I think just, you know, put it into the next quarter because things change so frequently with a SaaS vendor uh, or SaaS software these days. But that gives you a good indication of what's next coming out and how quickly do they actually release stuff. Um, and then I think also it's just about what makes you stand out. You know, I'm, I'm I'm interested. Don't be afraid to say, listen, I'm considering you with this company and that company. What is different about those two companies? And then you'll really see the sort of areas that maybe you've forgotten to ask the other vendors on. Um, and and you can make a comparison because if that's important to you, then you you need to, to appreciate. So I think those three sort of very generic um questions are very important and then about the support because as you said you never go you go in with hope and it's never going to be perfect okay we try and make sure it all is and everybody I'm sure does as well in the other companies um so you need to then also understand your support so like for example we have a happiness team they're all focused on ex recruiters okay so it's not tech support it's uh, in the one location and they can you know you, you can basically ask recruitment questions rather than tech questions. So I suppose it's then understanding that support that you're going to be getting um, when you're actually with that company and that vendor as well is a really good sort of follow up question too. And when do you finding, I actually we did have this on one of the integrations that we did, do you find that people will bring in ex, external consultants to help roll it out? And how, do, how does that typically does that typically work? Like? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's getting late here. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Um, so we do, but they probably are a little bit bigger than your sort of one to 15 market that you're looking at just now. Um, so I would suggest that, um, you know, 15 to 20 plus, mm -hmm. there is a, a growing sort of market for having a, a um, an external sort of consultant that will help them procure and also deliver. And there's some great customers out, you know, there's great companies out there um, that, that will help that journey. Mm -hmm. um, I think the one to 15 man um, sort of target that you have here, um, it is down to the business owner, you know, ultimately, it's a big investment that they're doing to change. So they tend to um, want to make sure that, that they're in control of that. And do I think that's wrong? No, I, I don't. I would probably do it that way myself. Um, but I would make sure that if I'm not a systems person myself, 
I would find somebody in my business that is, mm. and I would en- empower them to be the one that's really front running it. Mm. Um, and and so don't just because you own the business, don't think it has to be you personally, but allow the other person, you know, a good sort of two months to really sort of make sure that this is a project that they don't have you know their same recruitment target to deliver on and they can actually put the effort into to to the migration or the um the, the web build or or the, the 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 actual configuration of the um the crm how that works in practice oh sorry no, no 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 go wendy sorry yeah. So how that works in practice, um, I think that's another great question, actually, about the vent vendor. We probably over service, I'll be honest. Um, and that's why if you it's like it's a, it's, a, it's a good sort of if you have like no onboarding cost um, to your software, then you are on your own. So you better be good at it. Uh, we, we do have an onboarding uh, a cost. Now, we don't make any money from that, but that is the amount of help and service that we provide in because we end up realizing that, especially at that sector of the market, one to 15, um, you know, the guys don't have the time. They're still recruiting and they don't quite know what they're looking for. So we probably do more um, in order to manage that project to make sure that the data is mapped. We'll actually go through like sort of two hour processes for all of that uh, online with them with their own system and making sure that they feel comfortable so so definitely no onboarding cost uh, take it at your you know take it at your your own peril because then you've got to be very good at doing it yourself with the larger companies that do use a third party yeah, it's very helpful because they know what they're doing. Um, and actually, you can pass a lot of the stuff that we would normally do um, over to them. And they can do a lot of the checking, for example, migrations, etc. But that's then basically sort of probably d- doubling the cost in that they're then paying that consultancy to take the brunt of making sure that it's right. Mm-hmm. So there's 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 good pluses and, and, and negatives in, in both ways. What do you say, Wendy, to... I've sort of worked under both systems where there's been a system that every second field that you put something in is mandatory and it's all about the integrity of the data and making it mandatory so that come that 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 data's entered for a point down the track which can sometimes for people who aren't great on admin just it doesn't go in at all because it's too hard. Frustrate then, them. Then you've got the other end of the spectrum where it's all so free flowing that it's a bit easy not to put anything in. How do you when you're sort of custom, because I guess they're all customizable to a degree, what do you find works best from that perspective? How, how tight do you make it? So I think the main thing is to, well, we, we do the approach. You've got exactly, it's just like culture. You know, you've got a different culture in different agencies. And I think, you know, data validation, we have some customers that are so good with, um, and I've just got the data slide up here, in that they are really working their data um, in that there's no point in having, you know, data on there that is not correct. And so they'll be very tight and they will be the one that wants to turn on all the mandatory fields. I think from my perspective, you've got to give, the recruitment owner the ability to decide where they sit on that scale Mm -hmm. so as long as they can control it and they can configure it and which ones they want mandatory and which ones they don't then great um i think the you know the 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 other side of it is that um yeah i mean free flowing you you've got to i i suppose you've then got a a, an agency that perhaps relies on individuals rather than maybe a team um, because you'll have then big billers in there that are able to find their own way through the data rather than potentially helping new recruiters coming in and guiding them through how to actually recruit and ensuring that, say, for example, um, when they create a job, you know, if there's good data in the system, then when they're setting up their automatic potential matches, they'll just go and fill the, you know, the mandatory fields in and they'll get you know, they, they'll get a good list of shortlisted candidates. Mm-hmm. Whereas if it's all for free flowing, then you're reliant on that recruiter learning themselves. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a data sort of setup, but it data actually dance. is more of a cultural thing. Yes. <laughs> cool. And, and what do you think's next in the world of, of, of recruitment technology? Where are we heading? Well, it's a real interesting one because actually as an industry, I'm sorry to say it, I wish we were, but we're actually not that advanced in terms of innovation. OK, so we quite like doing what we do and just trying to find small, smaller changes, um, you know, because this this solution in terms of we call it predictive recruitment. Um, and, and that's really where we had brought in sort of predictive recruitment, analyzing everything that's happening in the web, understanding the interaction, what they're looking at, what does that mean and scoring their interest in terms of predicting when they're looking for a job. Mm-hmm. 
And that came in in 2010. Um, and our UI was totally fresh and new. You know, there was no boxes. There was no anything in it. And interesting for the first couple of years, um, you know, I had customers saying, oh, gosh, you know, I just don't think the color, you know, I'm, we're quite used to the grays and whites and the boxes that pop up. So there, I had to almost taper down a lot of the innovation that I was throwing into the product early down uh, earlier on, because actually commercially, you know, we weren't quite there. Mm-hmm. Now, I think we're moving at pace. Um, But recruiters have to understand why, which I get. Um, So where we're going (laughs) um, (laughs) it will always be, I think, you know, right now, if I look at the world of technology, you know, we're looking at chats, uh, chat box, you know, bots coming on board. We're looking at predicting stuff through different Chrome extensions. We're sort of incorporating all of that sort of uh, information and we are getting close to, you know, actually analyzing this candidate would be a fit for X amount of companies and these are the contacts that are ready to hire. And, you know, these guys are, you know, largely they go into a growth mode and really joining the dots of all this data, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm hugely excited about that. Uh, I see us as a recruitment agency right now thinks they're a recruitment service business, but actually I argue that they're a data business and it's really exciting what they could do with all this data in order to to pull it together but that's where the technology is just now um i would suggest that we're probably a couple of years down with really sort of harnessing that becoming mainstream you know right now we're probably mainstream of you know what can we do with the web and can we actually convert candidates and leads through it mm-hmm. uh, which i'm delighted at because that's where we've been sort of story has been for the last five six years mm-hmm. but that's really where we are sitting just now and then actually we've got a left curve ball <laughs> whenever you're doing those sort of pest analysis in your business um and i was just telling you uh, you know over in europe we've got a, a huge challenge in front of us because it's called gdpr mm-hmm. um but it's essentially the largest changes to uh, data protection in the last century. Um, and, and it's one that puts the candidate from a recruitment perspective, it puts the candidate back in control of their own data. Um, so, you know, this is just an example of an average database here, sort of 14,000 candidates. And within two years, well, in the last two years, the, the average recruiter that we see, you know, 85 percent will that we call it dead data. And that's candidates that have not been engaged in the last two years. Well, effectively, come May next year, the recruiter is for the fact that they've got to demonstrate what consent, ideally within 30 days of taking that candidate information, if it's personal information on that candidate, like a CV. Um, and they've got to then demonstrate that, you know, if a candidate has not engaged with them for potentially two years, then they have to remove that data. That's massive. So if you can... Totally. And likewise, a candidate has um, the right to basically request all of their information to be removed. So if you imagine somebody has, um, you know, not showed up for your interview, messed you around, and then they say, request to remove, thanks. Recruiter comes back, tries to find them in their database. A, they can't even find them to call them and say, why didn't you show up? (laughs) But B, if they come in six months later, you know, Oh, going to be big, you know, really hard to actually find and, and see the fact that that candidate kind of messed you around just six months ago. So that's a huge change. Mm-hmm. You know, we're driving that data and the use of data within Europe. You know, we've got to now start to adopt to actually having true engagement with candidates. So for me, I'm really positive about it, although a lot of people are freaking out. Um, because it does really focus on true engagement and will set the good guys you know, apart from the people that are maybe just spamming emails all the time, Mm. sending CVs out to clients that candidates don't know have been sent out, you know, and just bad practices. I really hope that this, it should um, help because there's major fines involved to recruitment agencies come May if they're um, next year, if they're not sort of uh, compliant with this. Gosh, that is is massive. And so it's, it's all across Europe, is it? It is, yes. It's it's one. Although we've uh, Brexit, um, but uh, though though we're coming out, it will be coming out before we have exited. So it will be one that's not changed, and it is uh, European Union rights. So um, or or legislation that's coming in. Okay, interesting. And so, Wendy, are there any sort of parting words that you'd like to to share? I mean, you've covered a lot, so thank you. And and don't feel under pressure that's to nice. come up with parting words, but <laughs> if you do have any. Well, I think a parting words, I think just um, 
listen, I'm in awe of everybody that starts a recruitment agency um, because you start uh, with excitement and 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 hope, uh, and and then it gets hard at some point. And I think you you know you and I have been successful in order to come out the other end and do something different. And also we had some you know we had a great exit as well. I think you had too. So um, which is fab. So I think it's it's just don't um, enjoy the good times, get through the bad, but keep going. Um, but be realistic that there are going to be sort of, you know, tough times, just like recruitment itself, but it is going to be tough times and seek out help, you know, get involved in communities uh, like Recruitment Garage, because that's where you'll get support and you'll get the motivation that you need, uh, because it is when you're running your own business, tough at the top sometimes. Mm. Wise words of a woman who's walked down that path. <laughs> <laughs> and so Wendy what's the best if people want to um to get in touch with yourself what's the best way to do so yeah delighted I mean I'm on all the social uh channels like LinkedIn you just do Wendy McDougall nice Scottish name it's M-C-D-O-U-G-A-L-L um and you'll find me but uh, feel free to connect with me uh to uh follow me on Twitter or linked you know obviously LinkedIn and uh um but you can also come through uh Farfish as well um if, if you get just get us through uh the, the info account um and happy to have chats with any recruitment owner that's uh wanting to to see how to do stuff yeah you've certainly got lots of lots of great advice and and you you obviously on the cutting edge of it all as well with everything that you've been sharing so thank you again so much oh, you. i know you guys are absolutely flat out and you, you mentioned before it's it's coming into your business yeah. time of year so I, I do appreciate you taking the time out to speak with us and hopefully it'll be the first of many conversations and i wish you all the very best oh i hope so thanks so much <laughs> thanks wendy 